Hello. In this episode we'll talk about Parallel. In my experience, Parallel is one of the most misunderstood type classes in CATS, and there are several good reasons for it. First of all, it's still a pretty new abstraction because it's only been around since like 2016, so it was introduced in PureScript around four years ago. And second of all, because it's still pretty new, there are not that many materials to learn from. But before we try to understand what Parallel is, I think it's very important that we understand the problem that it's supposed to solve. So let's get to it. The root of the problem is in composition. In this case, it's the composition of effects. And by effect, I mean a monadic type like either or IO. In fact, these two are examples of commonly used effects that suffer from the same problem. Let's look at them in detail. Either is a common data type included in the SCA standard library that can express the presence of a value or the reason for its absence. That makes it a perfect fit for performing validations on certain values, such as checking the length of a string, the maximum value of an integer, or any other condition that can be expressed as a Boolean predicate. We can compose either's in several ways, for example using the flat map function, which if we have an either that is a left, will just stop on that left, but if it's a right, it will take the result of that right and provide it to a function that we pass to flatmap, which will produce another either. The problem here is that sometimes the validations that we have are independent of each other, and we would like to benefit from that by collecting all the errors, if there are any. So we might have a tuple of either's or a list of either's, and for example, if all of them are lefts, they are all invalid, then you would like to see all of the reasons why they were invalid. However, either doesn't normally provide us with a way to do this because it's a monad. So in flatmap, it's basically, you can see it in the signature that if you don't have a successful value in the first either, the, the second one will just be ignored. So you cannot take two either's and combine them with flatmap because you'll only get errors from one of them. We can build a custom operator for either that will take two either values and the semi-group of the error type. This will define how the two errors will be combined into one. And as a reminder, you get a free semi-group for any type if you wrap that type in a non-empty list. Using a pattern match or a fold, we can ensure that no errors are lost when using this operator. And now we can use fold or reduce to scale this up to a whole list of either's. Problem solved. Thankfully, this sort of pattern is so generic and so common that it was encoded in a different type. It's called validated. And it looks just like either, but it composes in a different way. It doesn't have flat map, it isn't a monad, but it has a semigroup and an applicative, both of which use the semigroup of the error type to combine the errors. We can safely convert between either and validated because they are isomorphic, they are identical in structure. For that reason, people often prefer to use validated as the default type for validations and only switch to either when they want to combine uh, to pass the result further. But you don't actually have to do that, you don't need to convert back to either. You can keep using validated and use the and then method on it, which behaves pretty much like flat map on either. But if you really want to use flat map because you just prefer the operator or you need a monad instance or you need the for comprehension syntax, then sure, you can convert back. To sum up, if you want to make either keep all the errors, you can define a custom operator or convert to validated, combine the errors in there and convert back again, or just use validated as the default type and switch back to either when necessary. I also mentioned IO. It is a common data type used in Scala for suspending side effects and other pieces of code that break referential transparency. For example, communicating with other applications, accessing the file system, and just walking through the network. IO is also a monad, and it also has a flat map operator which runs one IO after another in case the first one succeeded. There are good reasons to run some effects at the same time. For example, you might want to start an HTTP server and while it's running, run some event streams in the background. Or you might want to make some calls to external services at the same time to save some time and reduce latency. No matter what your motivations are, sometimes you want to do this and we cannot use flatmap for that simply because it also requires the result of the first IO to exist before we can run the next one. 
so flat map is off the table. We would need a different operator than flat map for that, one that would take two IOs and start them at the same time, and when they are both completed, it would return the results of both of them. Thankfully, we don't need to implement this ourselves, because every modern effect system in Scala provides an operator for this. So we can use it to run two IOs in parallel, three of them, or an entire list. And again, we solved the problem. The problems that we had with either and IO are very similar. We needed to work around the fact that composition of these types is sequential by default because they are monads. We defined or used a custom operator that would combine two values of the same effect and return another value of this effect, but with a tuple inside it. The only difference here was that the either version required a semi-group of the error type, but we can ignore that for now. You should also notice that we built something on top of these operators in the same way. Of course, the types were different and the exact name of the operator was different, but we built a tool that allows us to combine an entire list of these effects in the same way, just replacing the operator that we used. It turns out that there are many more operators that we could have defined on top of this small operator defined separately for IO and either, and they also wouldn't be different in the implementation, just the operator being used. So why would we have to repeat ourselves for IO, either, and maybe other types that have the same properties? Maybe there's an abstraction in there, so let's look for it. If you know what an applicative functor is, maybe you've heard that values of one effect can be combined using an applicative instance into one value independently. If we look at the simplified definition of applicative, then zip does actually look like something we might want to use. If we define an instance for IO and for either, taking the semi-group at the point of constructing the instance, so now the signature of zip will actually match the one that we had before, then that could work for our purpose. Unfortunately, there's a problem in that. Applicative is a super type of monad, so every monad must also be an applicative. And both of the types that we talked about are monads, so they will have an applicative instance already. And it turns out that it is not exactly what we used, because flat map of a monad must be consistent with the zip, and that is defined by the following law. The law is using a method called app, which we haven't seen yet, but it can be easily defined using zip and map. So we found applicative and it seemed like the right solution for our problem, but then it turned out to be insufficient. What can we do about that? We can define another type class. This looks a lot like applicative, but only in the signature. In the implementation, we will make sure to combine the two values independently, no matter what. And we could go one step further. But before we do that, let's take a step back and look at our effects again. We can remember that either and validated are the same in structure. The only difference is in behavior. Either is a monad, and when it encounters an error, it just stops. So it stops early. But validated is not a monad, it's only an applicative, but because of that, it is allowed to combine all the errors uh, from all the values without stopping anywhere. Similarly, maybe we could define a variant of IO, which isn't a monad like IO, but is an applicative and is allowed to combine two IOs in parallel in the applicative. There's again a common core in these two situations. We have two types that are identical in structure, and one of them is a monad, and the other one cannot be a monad because it has an applicative that would be inconsistent with the monadic operations. We can make the next step and define a common builder for types that have these properties for their parallel instance. The builder will take two type constructors, a monad instance for the first one and an applicative instance for the second one. We will also require conversions between the types in both ways and for that we'll need something called a polymorphic function type. This is just so that if we provide, for example, an IO of string, the conversion will result in par IO of string, so the type will not be lost. In cats, this is known as function k or a squiggly arrow. Given all these parameters, we can now implement par zip by converting both instances of the sequential type to the parallel one, and then 
performing a zip inside the parallel context using the applicative instance and converting back to the sequential type. So now that we have this common builder, all we need to do to create instances for IO and either is pass the required parameters. So most of the heavy lifting is now done by the builder and we don't need to implement the logic again and again for every type. So are we done? Is this a proper abstraction, a proper type class? As you've already seen, good type classes have laws. And so far we haven't written any laws for this. What is more, we cannot really write any laws for this because the only mention of the types that we go to and from is in the instance definition, not in the type class itself. However, if we take all these relationships that we used when creating an instance, maybe we can encode that in the type class itself and that will give us some interesting laws. For example, the run trip law, which says that we can go from one value to another and back without losing any information or anything else changing. So this is the real definition of parallel, a relationship between two types, one of which is a monad, the other an applicative, a conversion between them that works in both ways without losing information and some algebraic properties that they have to conform to. On top of parallel, on top of an instance of parallel, we can define many useful operators such as par traverse, par map n, par doubled, the left and right parallel shark operators. All of this is implemented in CAS and you can use that. There are probably many more operators uh, mostly the ones related to Traverse. And it is also worth knowing that there's a less powerful variant of Parallel called Non-Empty Parallel, which is actually a super type of Parallel. It doesn't have as many constraints. For example, it doesn't require a full monad and applicative instance. It's uh, just flat map and apply. So it can be defined for types that don't have an applicative or don't have a monad. We can use that as well. And many of the functions that we already mentioned would be uh, also possible to implement with just non-empty parallel. So it's a less powerful constraint, uh, which requires less power from the types. To sum up, today we learned what the relationship between either and validated is, what common problem either and IO have, how parallel solves that problem, how it's encoded in cats, and what operators we can use from cats uh, that work on parallel. So let me know if you liked this video, leave a comment, slap a like, uh, subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed the videos, and I'll see you in the next episode. Thanks for watching.